So the project that we have in the exhibition is called Slate Cabin and it's a small hiking cabin that's built over in mid Wales. And it relates to a particular manner of dwelling, which I guess is impermanent. So the idea being that people grow and stay in this cabin for a temporary period of time and get the opportunity to sort of escape their everyday lives and go and experience um, a particular landscape in a way that's very simple and basic and sort of strips things back to their most elemental. So that's the sort of um, genesis of the project, I guess. My uh, project is a studio apartment, uh, aptly named The Studio, uh, and it's a 27 square metre space. Um, and I guess uh, in, in Sydney or, in, or at least in Australia, studio apartments tend to range from about 15 or 16 square metres through to about 35. So in that respect, um, it's sort of middle of the road. To begin with, it was a plain, uh, open plan space, um, but it benefits from um, a really beautiful light quality, um, breezes, um, views, and a reasonable orientation. Big World Homes is really about a modular housing system that can be either relocatable to think about what the site is or it can be something that is made by um, the homeowner themselves to gain back control to be able to um, have what I believe is a right which is habitation and at the moment not everyone has that right. Uh, the Waterloo House is a um, uh, alterations and additions to a lovely little heritage um, house in Waterloo and it's one of uh, a, a number of intact terraces um, just off Dank Street. And it's, um, it's, it has this incredible um, uh, dip in the middle of the road where this particular house sits, where all the parapets and all the balconies line through, but you get this big dip in the middle where he is, which means you, you get this sort of four metre ceiling in the in the main living space and, and the, the, the um, entry. Um, so it sort of goes from 2.7 to 4 metres at, at that end. So it's, although it's small, it, it, it had this sort of um, incredible scale to it. And it was a, a lovely sort of brief where they weren't, you know, they're, they're an established family with one child, not looking to grow that family. So weren't, um, trying to create too many rooms. As we went through the process, it was, um, it was constantly about sort of making the right decisions for each space and weighing those needs up with any impact that making that bigger may have on the outdoor spaces. So it was a real balancing act where the client was heavily involved in, in just trying to get that balance right. Permanent camping is all about um uh, a return to the sort of minimal living uh, idea of uh, a, a tent, um, but a, a, a tent for uh, one or two people. Basically, it, it, it's about the in the environment, in, enjoying the environment with the lightest touch possible. The the, the, the building itself, um, I suppose, was conceived as as a permanent tent, um, a building that you could. Uh, leave uh, and it would protect itself. The sides open up when you're there like a flower and close down when you're not there, protecting it from the elements, the fire, the snow and uh, extreme conditions. And when it is open, uh, the sides open up, uh, it, it, it reveals a sort of a beautiful pristine um, interior which is protected from uh, the solar uh, and the uh, and other ravages of the weather uh, while you're not there. Uh, it came about because two friends of ours were actually looking to buy a property uh, in Surrey Hills and my wife and I, being a, an architect and a designer, we were always you know, out there looking at properties that come up, particularly interesting ones. And this one we thought was really interesting because it was originally a butcher's shop. But what they really wanted to do was have someone come in and, and really tell them how they might go about building on the qualities of the space over a period of time. It was definitely never going to be a let's do it all at once. And so we did that, advised them, and then a little bit later they actually had the money to do stage one, which was essentially the kitchen. 
um, which we completed in about 2012. And uh, about uh, two weeks or so ago, we signed a contract to uh, do stage two, which was to build a pavilion on the roof. The client had owned the apartment for quite a long time and um, she wanted to um, harness the growing popularity of Sydney's sharing economy and create um, an independent hotel suite that would allow um, an authenticity for the traveller. So it, it's really about creating a hotel pad that's really like being at home. The project that we have included in this exhibition is uh, an adaptive reuse to an existing semi-detached house in Bronte. Um, I suppose it's, uh, it's an example of the sort of intensification of an existing housing type, um, taking what was a two-bedroom house and transforming it into a four-bedroom home um, with a lot of the things that people would typically ask for in a big family home. Provide new living areas that complement the existing uh, masonry structure. We've provided a series of uh, new rooms that each have a separate and discrete relationship to the outdoors that extends beyond framing a view, but rather we try to design the inside and outside together and the building is just a way of collecting those spaces together. The project is a $38,000 tent house. And um, several years ago, I was looking for a block of land to build on. And I was looking down the south coast of New South Wales, looking for something radically different to where I had been with the family. And um, we'd been on pit water and the still water and the forest, which is a very reflective place. And um, I'd looked up and down the coast and even gone out as far as Mudgee. And I went to South Avalon Headland with my son to go surfing and I turned around there was a block of land for sale that I'd been um, looking at and and having a sense of for 20 years and for some reason for some unknown godly reason or spiritual reason I said there's the answer but I didn't know how much it was going to cost so after selling everything that I owned, I was able to buy the land only. And so it came out of a, um, a sense of economy and it came out of a smaller sense of adventure and it came out of a sense of maybe pushing ourselves to live again. And so we began living there four and a half years ago now and um, we have one gas jet and an open fire almost every first or second or every second time we cook we cook on the open fire so I've got to cut timber as we had to when we were indigenous and um, and it's really um, I guess it's reinforced or redefined um, the essence of living. I think being designed by Harry Seidler, it, it's already um, a very good uh, apartment building. It has um, a lot of really good aspects already. It has fantastic access to sunlight, uh, every apartment has true cross ventilation through it. Um, they're very private apartments mm. and while they, they actually don't comply with any of the numerical controls that we have today, it complies very much with the intent of those controls. So it achieves them in a different manner. Mm. We, we, we saw an opportunity to keep all the good parts and um, reconfigure the apartment in a way that wasn't possible when it was built originally. So originally it was built with a separate kitchen, um, separate bathroom, and that was a requirement at that time. Um, now we have a little more flexibility. Um, there was an opportunity to open the kitchen and create a larger living 
and effectively unlock another room through the reconfiguration, which was a, a proper dining space. Um, so that was probably the main reconfiguration of the, of the space itself. Um, and then it was really about how you, um, how we then clean the interior of the apartment and how we, how we articulate all of the individual functions of the different spaces. Uh, and we came up with this idea of inserting one sort of singular piece of joinery that wrapped all the way through from the living room uh, through into the kitchen and then up into the, into the, uh, into the living areas. The existing house, a building envelope, and whatever happened in between, that was up to me to uh, add or remove to manipulate space, as architects would do. Yeah, I mean, the existing house uh, had a, a, almost a complicated heritage um, history, and we really couldn't work out what was there in the past. We think it might have been two dwellings together, um, but you, you get to a point where you just almost don't worry about it, and you just think, well, what is the space? Who cares about the heritage anymore? When you were removing the parts at the back that were damp, dark and rat infested, you know, they had to go. So I started with that basic um, conception that we would have a big space at the back and smaller space within the existing dwelling. But it's the gaps that are interesting. It sort of plays into our approach in the sense that we're always looking for opportunities to do as little as possible. And so if you've got a perfectly good house, which is great for sleeping, it's great for bathing, it's great for those private functions, then if we can offer, and it's come more and more into our work lately, we've been doing more projects where we're simply keeping the existing house, moving all the bedrooms into it and building a new pavilion to the north, which really activates that entire property. It uses much less resources and it's, it's a gentle approach, I guess, but it's, it's more of a design strategy to yeah, find a place where people can exist and, and gather in the sun. The main room was fantastic because it was the old shop. It had a real volume and scale that was uh, very, very nice. And that was the thing that caught your attention. And it had a backyard with rear lane access where you could park a car, which was another thing sort of tick in the box. But it was that interstitial space between the main room and the backyard that was the focus of the project. How do you make something out of that space and connect both the outdoor space and that main room. So we decided to develop this sort of linear kitchen and celebrate the fact that you move through the kitchen to the backyard and the kitchen then becomes the hub of the whole house. But in terms of the movement patterns around it, you were getting people coming from the main living space, turning right and going up the stairs, others turning right and then doing a little diagonal across to the bathroom and those that went straight through to the backyard. And it started to set up this um, sort of fulcrum around which everything rotated. Approaching a project, stopping and considering what's there. I think that's, that's the key thing, that little, little bit of time to think at the start and decide what's really important. What we found was that, like most things, it wasn't just the original timber cottage. Other additions, permutations had happened along the way. Uh, often we find that we are, when we're presented with projects like these, we're the third or fourth uh, iteration of how people are living on that, on that site. Um, so what we'd found when we were looking at the, at the project was that this, this original timber cottage, which had something quite nice about it, had been slowly but surely suffocated over time as each addition, as each uh, economically pragmatic addition came along. Uh, it slowly but surely put pressure on the way people could live in this space. Mm. Uh, and I think also it wasn't just what had been added to the cottage, it's how the cottage had been repaired very basically. So there was actually very little left of anything that had it you know, any particular heritage value, there is very little original fabric. And so all that was left was a form and an idea of a cottage. For example, what we've really tried to do is to create each of the new rooms in the house uh, are designed with the relationship to the outdoors and each of them are trying to do effectively the same thing at different scales. 
downstairs we have uh, a living area where we think of the fence as being the perimeter of the room. Um, so we have doors that separate inside from outside, but they're flexible enough to allow you to open that opening in a few different ways so that really we kind of described it as within quite a tight site, being able to live between the fences, um, fence to fence living if you like. And um, then again, upstairs we tried to do exactly the same strategy with this kind of unlikely little balcony that the master bedroom opens east into a, a small internalized courtyard that um, effectively is carved into the existing roof form. And that's the way that uh, we've tried to resolve, you know, often it's the connection between new and old or between elements that is, um, you know, the, a key part of resolving a design. And I suppose that relationship of actually using a void as the connection um, is one where we, I suppose, again, it's, it's kind of prefacing this idea of the outdoor not necessarily being a view. Um, this project is really about almost making that outdoor space another room. The use of joinery was probably the specific architectural idea. The bed pl platform is raised, so we're using the height of the existing apartment, which was quite a generous ceiling height. And that then allowed us to create storage underneath there, either through sort of flipping up or pulling out. We also um, created a joinery piece which separates the sleeping area from the living area. Um, and in raising that, we raised the bathroom level also, which allowed us to relocate services um, in a much more economical way. You know, the way that we approach any design is from a conceptual point of view. So it's never style based. It's always, you know, what are we looking at? And, and so what's the, con what's the conceptual driver? Is it, is it the context, you know? And in, in this case, the conceptual driver was the clients and the way that they needed recharging or protection when they came home. So this idea that the facade of the building could stand as it always has done for over a hundred years and that no one in the street would really know what was happening behind. And so as we, as we stripped the building apart inside and pared it back and opened it up and let in the northern light, the rest of the world has no idea what Russ and Steph have inside. So for us, I guess it's, you know, it's, it's about the secret discovery and it's about um, keeping their private lives private. And the interesting thing about Double Life House is that it's in Surrey Hills in Sydney. It has beautiful weather. I'm a Melbourneian, so, you know, it seems like an incredible kind of opportunity that was totally missing there. So for us, um, the entire northern half of the house becomes outside, even though it's inside. So that brick paving, uh, that herringbone brick paving, which runs out across the kitchen, across the dining room, out into the courtyard is kind of this continuous paving. Um, and it's, you know, we've used very, very thin uh, steel glazing to be able to keep that, you know, I guess keep that connection between the north courtyard and the dining space. And then we've paired back the roof so that we've got this light coming all the way in. So when you're in that kitchen dining area, you know, you, might, you, know, you may as well be outside. And again, with the bathroom, we just peeled the roof off in there so that, you know, the bathroom, as you step out into the shower cubicle, you know, you're stepping outside. So it's, you know, I'm just very, very envious of the Sydney climate. <laughs> These small projects allow one to be inconsistent, I guess, and to explore incredibly particular intimate moments that often have nothing to do with each other. And big projects don't seem to have that intention of often. You know, they're much more about patterns and about the big moves and the sort of, the sort of coherent ideas because that's something that allows the project to be sustained over many years by lots of people. But in a small project, you don't need that because you can sort of finish it off. It's almost like set design. You finish it off in a couple of weeks and then if it's a balls up, you sort of move on to the next thing. You think, well, you know, that, that didn't work, but I'm not going to sort of undo it because you just almost have it as a, an idea of what you don't do next time. When. So there's this incredible looseness and, and freedom in these much smaller projects, I think. 
the apartment is actually as much outside space as, as inside. And that was something that I've always kind of, well, as an office, we've tried to sort of use that model in all the houses, is that instead of making maximizing how do you minimize the, uh, the inhabited space and how do you maximize the garden space. And that's a big challenge in residential work these days where everybody wants bigger and bigger and bigger. So for me, it was an easy thing to realize that I could make my sort of roof garden as, as big as the apartment itself. And it's a kind of a place that just makes itself, you know, just ev so it's got this amazing seasonal thing, which I just, you know, I just, with the house itself is quite stuck, you know, it always, it, it's kind of this weird thing where the, the house is stuck, but the gardens are sort of incredibly agile and sort of changing world. And the, I think you need both. Otherwise, you know, there's a kind of a huge gap in, the, in your life. You know, I've got a, you know, this obsession with light and sun. And, and so it's like using, trying to sort of use mirrors and windows and skylights to kind of just make it feel as bright as possible. You know, I've sort of got this fear of darkness. <laughs> Not like this. <laughs> but you know that it just always felt kind of um, ephemeral almost, the place. that it, I mean, the staircase is painted white, gloss white. I've used gloss paint everywhere in the apartment. Um, so everything's kind of either gloss white or gloss black, or this, now I've got this aluminium paint. And you know, so it's, it feels kind of slithery or something. It's like it doesn't feel fixed. You know, I think you're just trying to find that, that unfixedness in all the spaces. The trick with small spaces is make them feel big. It, it's really quite simple. So that's where you work with the volumes and the scales, and that's where you set up a hierarchy. And I think the hierarchy in small spaces just starts smaller. So you start at a smaller point and finish up as high as you can. But once you have that hierarchy, you have a scale to work with in small spaces and you need that scale. Compartmentalization is the mistake. You know, spaces need to bleed. You need to bleed into other spaces, into outdoor spaces, uh, into roof volumes to actually let people be free. And I think one of the tricks is doing that. It allows the acoustics of a space to move throughout the space. And I think that lowers the level of you know, reflectivity of acoustic nature, but it, it, it just makes a sort of a softness and a wholeness. It's like the, the whole house is an organ and it has all the spaces and the blood is pumping throughout it and it exists in a far more compact way. Yeah, we just searched for one gesture, one maneuver um, that would be clear in the room and that would solve as many problems as, as we could. And so that was our, the curved wall was that, that one intervention and it was able to redefine the rooms but also provide storage which was really required in the space and then also allowed for integration of a, a better kitchen which was in dire need of an upgrade. I think it's, 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 it's being as minimal as you can with what, what require, one requires as a human for shelter. It requires uh, a place to sleep, uh, a place to prepare food uh, and, and shelter out of the rain, the snow or the sun. And this building is just that. It is no more and no less. So that first diagram was what's the space that's left over once you get all the stuff in, because in a sense that becomes the space for living. So it's a real kind of um, idea about storage as poche within the plan and storage as organisational strategy for the spaces of the house. But then I suppose the, the storage of the bikes, instead of being bikes within a, a you know, dense cupboardy thing, they became an element hoisted into a void. So it was a way of, um, the void becomes a way of separating old and new, letting light and air into the centre of the terrace plan, which was dark and wet previously, and then and then using that void again as storage. So everything's just got this, you know, this storage heavy overlay. 
overlapping spaces defined by cabinetry is really the is really the central idea and that what that allows us to to do is come up with five different configurations four or five different configurations um, one of them being that you either have um, four sorry five rooms or you just have one big room and that's all kind of circulating in a spiral internally and so that's from kind of the most private room which is the toilet um, which is just where the WC is and that can be closed down and then that, that's a, there's a sliding door that moves into the, the bathroom as a whole and then that opens out into the living area and then with the sliding panels and doors you can either have two separate bedrooms divided by the living dining room or all of those can kind of fold up and collapse and then you can just have one big space so it's it's really about trying to kind of define the limits of make make some rooms work as individual rooms but then make the whole apartment work as one big room as well we developed a strategy where um, we inserted a series of volumes at the the back of the original cottage the first one was a void um, and then the three after that were these masonry volumes that slid down the site and opened up the hole, each getting narrower, like um, a telescope, and opened up the whole of the, the rear of the building to the north sun, to the air, um, letting a bit of light into the place. Mm, it wasn't so much about creating extra room or extra space. Um, and interestingly, the, the light well, which is a key uh, component to the solution on the site, it was deliberately left without program. So it's, people will say, well, what goes on in it? Well, whatever, really. That's no, it's, it, it doesn't have to be occupied necessarily. It just needs, uh, it's just that space, that, that, that little bit of sort space. of architectural punctuation mm -hmm. to, to actually be able to see what was there before or what was meaningful that was there that we've kept. And then to consider the new approach, the new um, building, um, which is predominantly uh, sand and stock brick. Uh, we deliberately used a, um, a locally made brick. Um, and uh, we, we just took that idea and, and built, built up from there. So there's a myriad of things we could have used, but we deliberately decided that it should be a, uh, a locally made brick where interested in the idea of what an endemic building might look like. Um, if it's even possible to have an endemic building anymore, I'm not, well, we're not sure. We're, um, but just starting with the question of, well, what would we make this building of and can we, uh, to, the, to as much um, as we could, can we use local materials? And so that, that was a, um, an important part of our response. The improvement in amenity comes mostly from the connection with the outdoors. Um, so uh, whether it's the existing sort of established front garden um, as you enter into the terrace or the new little south facing courtyard that the dining room and the study above opens up onto and a couple of new cuts into the lounge room and the, the daughter's bedroom from the level above that look onto this, um, connecting clearly with the the um, backyard, which was always a beautiful um, um, brick pave, uh, like a, there's a lovely old heritage um, toilet outside and, you know, because they did so much entertaining out there, they had a, a, a lovely old timber pergola and so really for us it was about trying to connect all these spaces through. In terms of the way we live in Sydney, there's always been this like desire to own your house on the quarter acre block of land. Um, but because of the cost of property and also the expansion of Sydney, like that's starting to become unsustainable and also unaffordable and unrealistic for a lot of people. So I think something that this apartment shows and other projects that we're working on is that like apartment living can be a luxury and there's no it's not a sacrifice, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a point which you uh, 
live into a, like a transitioning zone where you're sort of going, oh, I'll live in an apartment and then I'll move into a house and then maybe, you know, when I retire, I'll go back to an apartment. Like most of the rest of the world have big cities where people live in apartments their whole life and that's not a compromise, you know, and I think that's something that Australians can start to learn as our cities grow, and Sydney and Melbourne in particular, that living in apartments, you know, can be a way of life and can be a really luxurious and comfortable and sustainable way of life too. I think in our, our office there's this kind of interest in minimising rather than maximising. And I think the impetus in a lot of, especially in houses, is that people just want more and more. And we, ne we you know, the struggle is to say, well, you can have these kind of intimate, particular places, and they can be unbelievably rich and powerful, much more so than these kind of bland, sort of blech kind of houses. So that's something that we do, I think all of us have, in our, the way we live, try and realize that. And you know, the funny thing is, I used to be quite embarrassed about living in a small apartment years ago when people came. You know, and you think, oh, I hope they don't say, like, where do you live? And you say, well, I just live in an apartment. You know, it's quite like one bedroom sort of thing. And the staircase is painted white. And, um, but you know, now I actually think it's, it's quite an interesting way of, of uh, like, you know, sort of almost moving your own work forward, that you can use this as a real example of what's pleasurable in, in living in a place. And that, as I said, like this kind of the intimateness is, is very important for us. And that's something that's it's difficult to explore it at a big scale. Oh yes, Palladio had this quality, I've forgotten who said it, but there was this kind of intimate grandeur. And we always thought that was quite a beautiful way of looking at the work. I mean, you know his houses. That, and they do have that kind of quality. They sort of, they, you go there and they're actually often much smaller than you think, but they, but they feel there's this kind of, you know, it's grandeur, but it's never overwhelming. It's never oppressive. It's never dominating. It's always kind of takes you with it. It's kind of, and that's a very amazing quality to have in architecture that you feel you know, that you want to be part of it rather than you're overawed by it. It allowed us to ask the question of what does one or what do two people need to live sufficiently and in a reductive manner? Because it does propose an impermanent way of dwelling, we had this opportunity to sort of strip away a lot of the artifice that typically comes with designing a home and explore living in its more elemental manner. And so we approach the project with this sense of um, what is sufficient or what is enough for two people to live comfortably and joyfully within a small space. And what we actually found through exploring that question is it stripped away the need for rooms. And what we could do instead was provide spaces or corners or, um, you know, sort of smaller moments within space that accommodated a particular activity. So rather than requiring a living room or a dining room or a bedroom, instead we were able to um, provide spaces for sleeping, for eating, for dining, for relaxing, for writing and so on. We think that has huge potential for the way that people think about space and occupy space um, in terms of, I guess, reminding us all that those divisions of space perhaps don't have to be as didactic as we all assume they need to be, and that there's opportunities to overlay and overlap and integrate those different functions in a way that creates new opportunities and new adjacencies that can be quite delicate and quite beautiful. The client is sort of a good representation of Australian society at the moment, who are, you know, they've brought up their families in the sort of Australian dream home with the backyard and the three bedrooms and the two bathrooms and so um, I think encouraging this you know how can you actually make apartment living um, something that Australians can start to relate to and how can you still you know say to the people that 
apartment living is able to, you know, increase density and have all these benefits that we really need to start looking at, but actually they can still have the same qualities that the great Australian dream aspires to in terms of what the home is um, and the amenity that, that you can get living in an apartment. Mm. How can you continue uh, the lifestyle of living in a you know, freestanding house into apartments? Um, uh, that was sort of the crux of the project, I guess. People are social beings, but they also need opportunities for respite and sort of um, moments to, to, to get away. And the idea about collective living is to be able to provide that diversity for people, um, provide a system where people can interact with others and have those support networks where they can, but also have the efficiency of, of combined resource use, but be able to have their own private, quiet spaces that they can reflect and, and get away from it all. So Big World Homes is very much at the starting embryo of a project. We're developing a technology and a set of systems to be able to create this adaptable modular housing system. Um, the, the next step for us is actually um, design a big world community and, and test out those ideas about um, co-living so that we have um, the opportunity to develop communities that can thrive and, and give back to their surrounding communities as, as much as they possibly can. I'm, I'm certainly of the opinion that um, we can live um, with considerable quality of life in more compact spaces. Um, and I'm also of the opinion that we can live with less. Um, from, from undertaking that particular project, I learned that um, in, in environments and in interiors that um, require constant interaction and allow for manipulation uh, and adaptation, we become more immersed in our environment and better understand how we live and how we like to live, um, and I feel that we that we that we we build greater relationships with with our environment through that adaptation and through that interaction and manipulation of space. So that's one thing that I definitely learnt. I also definitely learnt that um, the relationship between or difference between I guess um, furniture and joinery uh, is is an interesting thing because or an exciting thing because I think we can sort of get by with, with, with one or the other in many instances. And I think joinery can be used to, uh, in, in ways that mean that we can live without conventional furniture pieces. And again, it goes back to that sort of living with less, but um, you know, joinery, joinery as furniture and joinery that doubles as, um, or, or joinery that performs two functions, performs more than one, one role. And the tent came about at a time when I decided not to do big houses anymore. So it was like the complete opposite, but I'd, we'd made that decision consciously. And it sort of reassured me that I'd made the right decision. And, um, and now that's reflected in our work very strongly. And I think that that needs to be thought about quite deeply. And so that's why I'm doing this interview and and presentation because I think it's evocative to know that you know a, an architect's been living in a tent for four years, an architect and his partner, but it's probably more evocative to think why and it's probably more um, it's more a conversation to understand um, not the reasons behind it but the outcomes behind it and the benefits that, you know, the social benefits. There's this really civilising thing about terrace houses where that front living room is this semi-public private space and everybody looks in terrace windows when they walk past and everybody who lives in a terrace looks into their neighbour across the street and so you, you're forced into being neighbourly and civilised. And I think that density does that. I think density forces us to be neighbourly and to live together and be our best possible selves. So when you ask how could we live better, I, it's almost like how could we 
be better and how can architecture support us being better humans and I think we do that by like not in a didactic way obviously but by um, creating situations where we're forced to be neighborly where we're forced to we're forced to be kind rather than to be shut up in in our compounds and I, I grew up um, in the suburbs and my, and what I love about living in the city and living in a very small house is that we'd never drive into the site and close the door behind us. So every time we enter our house, there's an engagement with the street and there's an engagement with our neighbours, whether we like them or not. And I think with that very simple move of making a pedestrian access to a house the primary means of getting in makes living better and people nicer. Yeah, it's really about about understanding that it's it's not um, numerical measures that make for good living. Uh, it's not specific sizes or um, targets that we have to meet. It's it's really how the space is put together and the the spatial quality that you can achieve by designing things well that can really um, provide you with a good space for living and that it's very possible to live in a, a much smaller space and still have a very comfortable life. In fact, it, uh, we enjoyed living there very much. It's that your life is, is quite simple in a way. You don't need very much. It's super easy to keep clean, yet it does everything that you need. I think also you think very carefully about the purchases you make. So if, you, if you're gonna buy something new, you have to let go of something else so your the decisions your, your consumer decisions are much more thought through and less um, less impulsive we're very interested in sustainable urbanization so where do people live and where should they be living um, and how do we help them achieve that fundamentally the, you know what we're finding is that um, if you put people near um, the places they need to be near their family, near their friends, near their schools, near their places of work, um, they start to need less. So they need less distractions. They don't necessarily need a media room, a two-car garage or a car shuffler. Um, if you share things like a rooftop laundry or a rooftop garden, your actual accommodation, your private house can actually get smaller. So I live in 75 square metres here with my wife and um, we often say, what are we gonna do with that second bedroom now that Tali has moved out? So we have a second bedroom with nothing in it. Um, so yeah, let me know if you've got any good ideas. <laughs> I've, got, I've got 11 square meters to rent. A small building, if it's designed well, if it's oriented correctly, if it's built within somebody's means, it does often result in, in a huge change to their life, a reactivation of a hobby or a, I mean, for ourselves, we've built our own studio and suddenly we've got a practice. So it's, you know, it, it, it makes a big difference, I think, mm. in, in the way people see themselves in their own properties. Well, I think it touches on a few things. There is this sense, I think, with this project and something we've tried to pursue whenever we get those alternate projects of having a really good look at the existing and saying what qualities are there. They might not be suitable for what the house is used for now, but what, what can it do really well? And wanting to retain that in order to minimize our impact and our footprint. Um, so we've built, in essence, a really small space that um, increased their usable living area by immensely mm. and made that house, particularly during the winter months where they couldn't live on their veranda, um, a very um, much more adaptable, isn't a it? much more adaptable yeah. place to live, um, without having to build a whole new house. I think it's, I mean, especially living in um, in a city apartments, it's about providing the greatest amount of flexibility and kind of um, tailoring that flexibility to kind of very real things. Um, I mean, I was very conscious when we were doing it to try and avoid just having everything being flexible in, in, a, in an equal way because of the fact that, you know, the whole sort of history of modernism and flexibility has sort of been so maligned because, you know, you make things flexible and then ultimately just end up putting it in one 
in one configuration and then just leaving it like that. So I was kind of quite aware of that, that aspect. But I think, especially in the context of apartments, being able to provide flexibility of different configurations and arrangements is a really, really important thing. There's something incredibly positive about being able to see the sky all the time, no matter where you live. And especially with this place that's so focused on the sky and because it's sort of perched on the ninth level up in the tower, you've got an aspect that's quite, quite expansive on the outside. So it feels very private. And I think, um, I mean, one of the things that we've done in sort of opening up the corners, especially the bathroom, so that you can actually now stand in the shower and see out, whereas before you couldn't, is that sort of notion that you're always kind of aware of the arts. You're always aware of the sky. You're always aware of whether or not it's raining or whether or not it's, it's you know, the sun is shining. And I think there's, um, I think there's something very positive, like there's, there's something about a mood that that sort of creates, which I think is really important for, for, for living. Um, just in kind of, just sort of feeling happier.